whether it's from the pandemic or the climate emergency, whatever is next, humanity is longing for some kind of collective salvation. And the one world solution is being backed by the Pope, by leaders of many churches, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury, He's basically preaching a kind of humanistic message with a few God words added onto it, not preaching the gospel. And you end up with, through that, with a movement which is actually anti-Bible and anti-Christ, which will end up with a form of totalitarian government which you can't criticize or question, which demands that you submit to its dictates and will end up impoverishing and enslaving us. If you go to page 27 and 28 of this magazine, I won't go into it now, it tells you how this leads into the Antichrist system, leads into the digital currency which they want to bring in, which would lead directly to Revelation 13, a system which you can't buy and sell. On the way, and behind this you can see this one world Babylon spirit at work, bringing the nations together, bringing together the iron and the clay of Daniel chapter 2, uh, which come together but don't stick together. So they come together, but they're not together because of conflicts within them. The idea that we've got to save ourselves, as uh, happened in the Tower of Babel. And what you're seeing actually is very much along the lines of the Tower of Babel. Let's read from Genesis chapter 11. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They made, made brick, they had brick for stone and they made asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. They have all become, they all have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because the Lord there confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Now there, let's build ourselves a city, let's make a name for ourselves human-centered ideology. We can do it ourselves without God. Let's save ourselves. Let's reach a tower which will read up, reach up to heaven. Let's become like gods. And God intervenes to scatter them because he sees the danger of this human potential movement uh, which separates them from himself. Going to unite and nothing they propose will be withheld from them. Unite, develop technology, bring it all together. And what we see today, also another dimension, which I haven't time to go into, but you see humanity coming together with technology, a human potential movement using artificial intelligence, supercomputers to link up humans with the, with, to save the world, uh, bringing together a union between humans and machines, which is actually satanic and right against God's will, and could in, in itself create something which would be totally an abomination to God. And God actually going to smash it before it gets to that point which is one of the reasons for the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Babel actually means confusion, or it can also mean the gate of God. Interesting little detail I picked up. Uh, before the conference uh, at Glasgow, the world leaders met in Rome, as you may have noticed in the G20 meeting in Rome. They were also blessed by the Pope, who added his little bit of information into it. They had a final dinner in a place called the Quirinale Palace in Rome. Just before they had this dinner, this palace held an exhibition to celebrate the 700th anniversary of the Italian poet Dante, who wrote the Divine Comedy, uh, specifically a section of it called the Inferno or Hell. The exhibition, which was inspired by the Inferno, was given the title The Gates of Hell. So the exhibition held at the Scuderi del Quirinale in Rome marks the 700th anniversary of Dante's death, it features more than 200 works from the Middle Ages to now presenting hell in all its forms. Former demonic Renaissance depictions of bodies toasting in fire and brimstone to experiences of hell in the earth, such as concentration camps in the Second World War. 
The curator said the exhibition is timely because this century we live in has become hell itself. So what's interesting is that just before they went to Glasgow, the world leaders met uh, in Rome at the gates of hell in the Quirinale Palace. Well, make of that what you want. <laughs> but they were discussing, and then they're discussing the earth which God made. And one of the things which you notice is that God doesn't get a look in. So he's telling you how to look up after God's world, but God is totally ignored. Uh, nobody calls upon God. Nobody refers to the Bible. No one thinks about creation. God is totally absent in any discussions which are taking place. And since it's God's world, God's not too happy about this. And Paul says about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes has clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and godhood, so they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Pressing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of God into an image of made by, like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. We're called not to worship the creation, but to worship the one who made it, the creator. And if the creation is in a mess, we need to ask the one who made it, how are we going to put it right? And in fact, we're not going to put it right because the end of days scenario brings us to a time when there will be huge trouble in the environment. Uh, God's been left out and God is not so happy about it. In the end times, God speaks about disturbances in the environment which are not necessarily caused by human activity. He speaks about the powers of the heavens being shaken about judgments of God, about earthquakes, famines, etc., and signs in the heavens. Here's Jesus' words in Luke 21, verse 25. It says, There'll be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Notice he says there, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Something going to happen will be shaking uh, the powers of the heavens. So that's not just what we do on the earth. It's what's happening outside. Things which we have no control over. Signed in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Distress of nations, sea and the waves roaring. If you go to Revelation 6 through to 19, it gives you some of the uh, outworking of this. Just read one passage from Revelation 8. It says, The first angel sounded, verse 7 this is, and the hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, one of the things which uh, written about again in this magazine is about that verse concerning the first angel and the hail and the fire following, mingled with blood, they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up. Uh, according to one interpretation of this, this is an exact description of something we call a coronal mass ejection. In other words, a solar flare. What would happen if a solar flare hit the Earth? Solar flare is a energy coming from the sun hitting the Earth straight on, and if the Earth's defenses are weakened through the magnetosphere being weakened, which it is, then it would have a devastating effect on what happens on the Earth. It's happened almost... Uh, it happened once in about 1850. It wasn't too bad then. If it happened now, it would be potentially devastating. It would knock out most of our communication systems, computers, etc. 
But one of the things which this article said was that if it hit straight, it would cause, first of all, uh, a rush of very cold air to come in from space, which would cause the clouds to turn into hail, so that you'd have a tremendous fall of hail to the Earth. That would be followed by tremendous fire coming down, which could then burn up the vegetation on the Earth. So he says that this, this description in Revelation 18, at Revelation 8, is a description of what would happen if this solar flare was to hit the Earth. Nothing to do with man-made climate, uh, global warming. It could happen as a result of some cosmic disaster hitting the Earth, which the Bible says is going to happen in the Great Tribulation period. It speaks about a great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. Um, what are they worried about? They're worried about asteroids flying around. And if one of them, a big one hit, fell into the sea, this is what would happen. Uh, so you have these things happening, signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars. Uh, another sign in the moon. One of the interesting things I've discovered is that NASA, the North American State Agency, has said that the moon's uh, orbit is wobbling slightly. If it was to wobble in a major way, it would cause, because the moon affects the tides, it would cause much higher tides and much lower tides. So if you had suddenly a high tide uh, with the water sweeping in, it would flood coastal areas, including London, New York, much of the East Coast, and low-lying areas around the world. Signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Jesus said these things are going to happen. They're going to happen specifically in the time of the Great Tribulation. In other words, in the final seven-year period before his return. They're going to be part of God's judgment upon the earth, which has rejected him. We're not going to stop them happening by resolutions made in Glasgow or anybody else. They're going to happen, and we need to be re realize that this is part of actually God's judgment on a world which has turned away from him. Sounds like bad news, and it could be bad news if it wasn't for the next thing which is going to happen, which is the second coming of Jesus. Jesus himself is going to come back, not this time as the suffering servant, but this time as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, Jesus is the creator. He was there at the beginning. He'll be there at the end. And as the creator, he's able to recreate the world which has been messed up. Uh, and some of the prophecies in the Old Testament, particularly about the millennial kingdom period, imply that he's going to make significant differences in the environment. Uh, one of them is about water being released, a lot about rivers in, in the Old Testament flowing. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 35, it says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom and abundantly and rejoice, even with joy. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Uh, Maybe a bit fanciful, but I think those waters could be part of God's cleaning up process for the mess which we've made of the earth in this time. Uh, one of the things they've actually discovered is that there is a vast amount of water at the center of the earth, hidden down there. Uh, if Jesus would actually release some of that water, cause it to come up and to, to cleanse the earth from all the defilements, then make the earth into the fertile place which it's going to be in the millennial kingdom period. Because the Bible says, that, say, as I said, that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule the world and there'll be peace and justice and plenty. Uh, Psalm 72 says he should have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. There'll be abundance of grain on the earth, on the top of the mountains. Its fruit shall wave like Lebanon. Those in the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. So it's not going to end with total disaster. It's going to end with Jesus coming. And when Jesus comes, he's going to bring the reverse of all the disasters. And because he is the creator, he can actually sort out the mess which we made of the creation. And I believe actually God wants to make sure that he has the last word, not Satan, and not man in his rebellion. And he's going to run the world as it should be. There'll be rivers in the desert, there'll be an equitable climate, there'll be plenty. He'll deal with all the man-made pollution and make an environmentally friendly social structure which may actually mean the end of fossil fuels, but be that as it may. And he'll reign for a thousand years. And finally, we'll close with this, the ultimate global warming experience will take place. 
2 Peter describes it in verse, chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's going to happen. And it's going to be ultimately not only this world, but this universe is going to be burned up and God's going to create a new one. He's able to do that. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And if you believe in Jesus, you're going to be there. If you don't, you're not. That's the final thing I want to say. There is an absolute choice between heaven and hell, an absolute choice between whether you go to be with the Lord in that glorious recreated uh, universe or whether you're outside in the place which really is the place of burning, the fire of hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, and nobody needs to go to hell. You need to repent, believe the gospel, and then you have a glorious future and a hope in Jesus Christ. So we have a warning and a hope, but we have a great hope in Jesus. And if we believe in Jesus, then nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Maybe difficult times coming, but he's with us always, even to the end of the age. And he's going to have the last word. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in Jesus. Pray that if anyone listening here or on the internet is not saved, that they will turn to you now in repentance and faith and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and so have a future and a hope. Pray for our loved ones who don't know you, Lord, whether they're children or parents or brothers or sisters. Pray, Lord, that you will open their eyes to the truth and that they will turn to you in these last days. We pray for the masses in the world who are uh, being led astray by all kinds of false and deceiving spirits, Lord, that they might receive the truth and they might repent and believe in Jesus and turn to you and there might be a great harvest of souls before you return. And we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you that you've done it perfectly the first time you came and you will do it perfectly when you come the second time. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen.